Hi, everybody. We'll let the laughter die down a little yeah. bit. Make sure I'm on. All right, guys, welcome once again to our Supply Chain Town Hall. This is, what, the third time we've done this? You are here today with Allie and the Chipmunks. All right, see what we did there? That was fun. All right. So um, my name, for those of you who I haven't had an opportunity to meet yet, is Allie Carson. I'm a senior manager with the Build Team, and I have the privilege of providing organizational development support for the supply chain organization. So can we take a quick pause there? Yeah. So no Facebook, no Twitter, <laughs> no Snapchat, <laughs> no other Snapchat. social media we're not aware <laughs> of. No. I feel like it's too late no, for that. No YouTube. <laughs> This will follow the JC workplace. I figured I was two minutes too late. <laughs> How many hits do we have? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as you guys know, I'm here with your two uh, co-interim leaders for supply chain, Doug Lindsay and Steve Hewitt. So welcome, guys. Um, we are here once again to answer the questions that you guys have um, have submitted beforehand. We're also going to have an opportunity sum to submit questions during the conversation today. Um, we're mixing it up a little bit. We do also have um, our group president, Lee Fetter, here with us today. We didn't get you an outfit, sorry, Lee. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> kind of figured you might be okay with that. So a couple of quick logistics before we dive into our conversation for today. This is going to be a 90-minute broadcast, just like what we did last time. Um, as you guys know, we've been playing with the different technology, trying to figure out what's going to work the best and be the best user experience. We did WebEx one month, we did Zoom, and this month, we are lucky to be able to utilize our BJC Media Services colleagues. So thank you guys for coming and joining us. Yay. We really, I'm excited about this because it's a great service for us to be able to have within BJC and for us to be able to utilize at no charge. Um, and it provides an opportunity for us to be consistent with the um, technology that's used for other venues. So like the town hall with Rich and Steve and things like that, which is always nice to do. Um, so we look forward to your feedback on this different uh, technology. For those of you who are joining us online, um, who are part of the virtual community, you will see that there is a form underneath the window where you can see the video. That's where you can submit your questions as you think of them over the course of today. So for those of you who are joining us virtually, that's where you're going to go. That actually sends an email to Mana, who is going to be monitoring her email box and, and capturing those questions so we can get those answered today as well. For those of you who are joining us in the room, You'll notice we do have the index cards and pins on your seats again. Feel free to jot down any questions on those. The other really cool thing that we get to do today, since we are using our media services colleagues, is we get to have um, roving mics. So if you have a question that you want to ask when we get to that spot, please feel free to raise your hand and we'll bring a mic over to you and you can ask your question live that way. So it's another cool thing that we're able to do with this new technology. Um, okay, I think I've covered all the logistics. Everything good? Good. All right. Sorry, your glasses are just going to throw me off all day. They're throwing me off. Yeah. <laughs> I warned him. I was like, you might be seeing double at some point. They're a little wonky. Okay, first things first. I know um, in the last couple of town halls, we've answered a lot of different topics, and we wanted to spend a little bit of time today going back to some of those topics and providing some key updates, because I know you guys have had a lot of work going on, um, a lot of follow-up to some of those items. So um, we're going to start there. I know one of the things you guys worked on was the bring your own device. Yep. policy and work. So tell us what y'all have been doing there. Sure. So BYOD, as it's now been dubbed, has <laughs> uh, now gone into effect. Uh, we've we had some time that took a little bit of delay trying to figure out when all the contracts expired. Um, it was also very insightful uh, for our perspective to understand where systems still need to be uh, improved and understood a little bit more. Uh, we've also had two lunch and learns. Uh, one was really walking through what the program was going to be about, answering questions, um, settling some concerns that were out there. And then finally, uh, the last uh, Lunch and Learn, we did uh, the Google Voice uh, class. For those of you that attended, uh, being able to uh, understand what that technology is, setting it up. And I know some of you have already started transitioning to um, your own device and putting Google Voice on as your contracts have expired. So. That'll be something that uh, we'll see over the course of the next year of that transition as contracts expire. There's also been several questions around the uh, policy of itself of who's in it, who's not, how do I be become a part of it, do I have to become a part of it. So there's been some revisions, um, I believe, as, as recently as last week around uh, the coordinators and pieces like that. So 
this is something that uh, we will be constantly evolving. So as you go through it, please give us your feedback. So there's things that if we need to address or make sure that the rest of the group is aware of that we can share with that knowledge. Sounds great. So I know another thing that we talked about or that came up in a prior town hall was something about these blue folders um, or document management or something along those lines. So can you tell us what's going on around that space? Yeah. So um, we, we've recognized that um, blue folders are not an efficient process to manage our contracts. Uh, we've also recognized that they take up a lot of real estate, especially in our most recent move, um, how, much, how many lateral file cabinets we had to do and just the maintenance of those. So sourcing along with our IT um, partners and our legal partners have been working on a uh, system solution and actually that is going to our system leaders tomorrow uh, in which uh, there's been a lot of um, review of several different systems and those three groups will be making their recommendation on a system to move forward with and then once we get the green light from our system leaders looking to then implement and move forward. So I would say over the coming months, you'll start to see some of those changes uh, taking uh, effect as we move from the paper world into a more consistent uh, electronic world, not only for supply chain, but across our organization. All right, thank you. So the last update from you, um, I know a big topic of conversation in our August town hall was around this idea of an alternate work environment and having some more standardization around that. So tell us what you did there. So. That acronym, AWE, I had to get used to. It wasn't <laughs> one I was familiar with. I kept on seeing it pop up in my email and wasn't, wasn't sure where that was going. But the alternative work uh, program that we're, we're putting in place actually starts November 1st. So uh, this morning, um, I believe you should have received in your email boxes um, the program, the outline. It is a pilot. It's something that we're going to be evaluating over the next six months to understand what's working, what doesn't work, uh, how do we need to continue to tweak it, or is it something that fits for us or doesn't fit for supply chain? So um, you'll see, the as you read through that, let us know um, if there's some input. We actually uh, uh, nicely copied uh, <laughs> from our build friends uh, what they're doing um, and took some of their uh, inputs to be more consistent about how other organizations within BJC are managing that piece. Mm -hmm. All right, so it sounds like we got some information today and more feedback appreciated as, yes. you, as you work through that. Very good, thank you. Um, okay, so other questions or other things that we've talked about in some of our prior town halls, um, you mentioned already with the move and the space and kind of how do we play in this new sandbox. So what updates do you have for us around that, Steve? All right, so first in the etiquette, the move, move space etiquette area, we, we have pulled the team together. So we have representatives from all of our departments at the BLI. So we're gonna come together and put together um, a set of operating rules, if you will, around our workspace and working close together and what, our, what we want our norms and rules to be. So stay tuned for that. There was not a consistent um, document that has been put together by any other department, so we get to build our own. I will add also, because it's been a recent issue, is just as a reminder, when we have suppliers coming in for meetings, to please remind them at check-in that this is a working office environment and when they're standing together conversing and talking, you know, it can get, that noise level can get raised up and so we are putting some things in place to, to work through that. Um, I know we were investigating potentially using that, that conference room uh, or having them congregate by the stairwell uh, once they've signed into RepTrack. So just remind them this is a, people are working, they're in their office and sometimes they get busy, you know, four or five people together, the noise level gets up. So another um, topic from before was around, you guys mentioned in August doing a stakeholder survey. Um, and I know that has been completed. You want to share a little bit of the highlights from that, what we know so far? Sure. Uh, first of all, we had really good response rate. And as a reminder, this stakeholder survey went out to uh, the ELT of BJC, uh, essentially all vice presidents and above in, in across the organization to include the hospitals and shared services. We also sent it to our specialty team members uh, who had a chance to participate. So um, over 100 surveys went out. We had a really good participation rate. We had 57% participation, a lot of great feedback. Some of the key highlights, uh, we're working on putting together a more detailed story around that survey results that you will see at a meeting coming near you. But in the, in the interim, um, a lot of what we heard back validates the value of the work that we are doing and that that value is recognized throughout the system. It also highlighted some of the 
the pain point areas that we are already aware of and working on, but it validated that we are trying to address um, the right things as we're putting together our strategic plan and our go-forward plan for 2018. All right, so it sounds like more to come on that as well. Um, another kind of follow-up item that we had, the last one, was around employee engagement action planning and kind of what are the expectations of the leaders, how might people check in, et cetera. Absolutely. So every department that had to do an action plan based on the results of the Voice of the Employee Survey, uh, those action plans have been put together and they are entered into the, our Voice of the, the Employee Survey tool uh, as a leadership team. So when we get together, when Doug and I pull the directors together in staff meeting uh, every, month, every week, uh, one of our monthly agenda items is a check-in from each of those departments on those engagement plans and steps that they've been working on the, uh, part of their action plan of follow-up and, and feedback from each other on how well we think that is working. Additionally, we are putting together, um, working with HR and some others to put together the opportunity to do some pulse surveys uh, later into 2018 since we're not going to do another BJC-wide survey until 2019. Um, but just to ensure that we're on track, we keep this front of mind. We don't want this just to be a one and done, check off the box, we're engaged. You know, and so engagement is an ongoing activity that we need to be involved in. Okay. Very good. So clearly a lot has been going on within the supply chain organization. Um, on that note, I know you guys had some recognition that you wanted to, to kick off here. So I think, Zeke, this is the time I get to invite you to come up and play. Um, where are our mics, Mana? Do you know? Jared, can you bring us a mic? So one of the things that um, we received some feedback on is how do we recognize the good work that's going on across? So we know that that occurs day in and day out, but one of the things that we're kicking off um, with uh, Greg and Zeke is that piece. And we would encourage that if there are things as we go forward in our town halls that we should recognize either through projects, either through outside work, inside work, um, please share that uh, with us so we can make sure that we are recognizing the good work that's going on. Now we can't do everybody every time, uh, but, <laughs> we can't, but we can start to make sure that um, how we are doing internally is being shared not only with our internal groups, but I'm also starting to hear that our videos are being shared outside of supply chain. So as that information gets out, it's a good way to highlight the good work that's going on. All right. Thank you, Doug and Steve. So um, my name is Greg Matlock, and um, rapid improvement events, or RIEs, provide value to supply chain organization by delivering small improvements quickly, which add up to major benefits. Uh, RIEs um, result in improved productivity, better quality, world-class safety, faster delivery, lower costs, and greater customer satisfaction, um, along with helping to, to sustain synergy between supply chain teams. Stephen, and Doug often mentions supply chain professionals doing supply chain work. Here we are recognizing seven supply chain professionals that have earned the status of certified PI project leader. Their journey to this certification began with extensive training last October, after which they completed a variety of projects utilizing the skills they had learned. These individuals have demonstrated that they can take on the difficult problems facing supply chain and deliver a fully realized, objective, data-driven solution that will sustain the benefits over time. So as I call your name, please come forward to receive your certificate of recognition. Okay. Lynn Kirsting. Sorry, Lynn Kirsting. Congratulations. Zeke, Zeke Meyer. Lynn, Zeke. Just stand over Thank there you. so I can call everybody up. Zeke, you're not done yet. Got <laughs> Aaron Rogers. Congratulations, Aaron. Jim Starr. Thank you. Appreciate it. You have to do a selfie. <laughs> and Mark Travis. Congratulations. Then we had two others who couldn't be here today, uh, Liana Baker and Aaron O'Donnell. So we can give them a round of applause as well. All right, so now I'm sure you all are asking yourselves, um, how can I be a part of this? 
Well, you're in luck. Um, the PI Project <laughs> Leader Program is available to all of supply chain. So if you're interested in this opportunity, um, please see me or ask your manager to submit your name for the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Good job. Good job. And I'm going to call an audible and ask you guys on Jim's behalf to line up when we're done today. We'll get a picture of all of you guys <laughs> together. Um, but that's not the only thing we're celebrating in supply no, chain, right? No. So I'd like to, um, those that were able to partake in last Friday's uh, BJC Shared Service Awards, uh, we had one of our own recognized as a leader uh, for 2017. So let's see, is Craig here? There he there is. He is. Yay! So, so, so Craig Butts was uh, awarded the 2017 BJC Leadership Award. Um, was against many uh, deserving uh, individuals, but uh, a lot of individuals across the organization of BJC wrote in on his behalf, and it was fabulous just to kind of sit down as I've gotten to know Craig over the last five years and see how his wisdom, his input, has really impacted BJC over his 25 plus years here. So again, congratulations. Awesome. I'm looking forward to having this recognition as kind of an ongoing part of, of these events because I think that makes them even more rich. As long as there's no dress up in the right. Oh no, this is now a thing. This no. is now a thing. <laughs> Not a thing. All right, so we did ask for um, questions to be submitted in advance. We sent out a survey monkey and just asked, you know, what is it that you guys want to talk about or to hear more about? So we've gathered um, those questions together. As always, we kind of pull out the themes and identify what are those things that we can address uh, through this menu. So we're going to start diving into those questions. The first theme of questions was really around what's going on at a system level at BJC. So there's a lot of curiosity around some of those kind of bigger picture things. Um, the first question specifically, and Doug, I'm going to start with you, was with the announcement of a new CEO, Rich Lightwig, in what ways do we anticipate supply chain might be impacted? Yeah, so as you all heard uh, a few weeks ago, um, Steve Lipstein will be retiring at the end of this year, and with it, um, we will be... Um, Rich Lightwig will be moving into uh, his replacement seat effective January 1. Uh, I would say that, that Rich has um, an appreciation for the work that not only we do, but uh, BJC does as a system. He, he came from that background uh, with uh, UC uh, San Diego and along with Duke. So a lot of good system thinking there. I would say that you're not going to see, it's not going to be a night and day switch. Um, Rich is one that's very methodical. He uh, make sure that he has the onboard um, thinking of a lot of different people, but he's also one that likes to challenge our thinking. So uh, again, January 1, it's not going to be a switch that turns on, turns off. But I would say that, that you'll start to see a lot of um, different input coming out of uh, ELT with Rich's guidance and leadership uh, over the coming months uh, within 2018. Anything else? No, I would just echo that. I think uh, you're not going to see a, a huge focus other than um, what we've already been working on. Healthcare is in transition. Uh, the way that healthcare, the business side of healthcare, and the way reimbursement, the things we're going to be challenged on and have been challenged on, we will continue to be challenged on. And it is our, our mission uh, to support BJC in, the, in its mission, in the delivery of care in, in our community and the role that we play in managing those costs and helping the system do that. Lee, anything you want to pipe in on this? No, you guys hit the nail on the head. Okay, good. Uh, I've been with Rich ever since he came to BJC, and it, I would have said exactly what you did. He, he has a, I think, a better appreciation for and understanding of what all we do and we're doing. Uh, that's not to uh, say anything negative about Steve, but sort of Steve was what I call a, sort of a wonky kind of guy. Big policy, big picture, uh, was well known around the country. Uh, Rich is more of an operations guy and uh, really appreciates how the uh, stuff works inside BJC because he's run hospitals before and he's uh, been very much part of it. So I think uh, I think we ought to invite him to one of these forums, yeah. not the ones where you got to dress, dress up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't want to scare Rich, but uh, I think it'd be fun for you of those of you who don't know him to get to know him as the the new CEO. Good guy. Okay, so um, another question, kind of keeping at this system thinking or system level, was around some of the events that are, um, have happened with Boone Hospital C Center and their relationship with BJC. 
Um, so any insight that you guys have around what folks can expect to see in that relationship or how it may impact their work in supply chain? Sure, um, and this is, we, we answered this in, in a couple of emails, but we'll just share for everybody, um, is that we've all read the papers, you see what's going on with the, you know, the county and the RFP process they went, that went through, and so what you read in the, in the press releases and what you've seen in some of the BJC uh, news that has come out um, is pretty much the insight that we have, and from our perspective, until we, at such time we are officially notified by our leadership that the relationship has changed. Boone is part of BJC. Their spend is a part of our spend. We need them to drive the savings that we're tasked with driving. And so Epic has just been implemented there. Uh, Sims tissue tracking is live there. All of that work is still in place until such time as we are told differently. Um, I would just, they're part of BJC and we, we treat that relationship as such. All right. Thank you very much. Last question um, from a system perspective was around this evolving relationship with physicians. So what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so this is a, a topic that has been evolving over the last probably five years, but I would say has really started to take steam over the last probably 12 months. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with um, our different insights in some of the learnings we had early on within supply chain and then being able to test some of those. So as a lot of you are aware, uh, with our most recent project in Spine, we've tested the pilots of how we integrate, um, bring together five physicians that represent the vast majority of spine surgeons uh, with representatives from both academic and community. Uh, we've had projects uh, in the past that seem to have had starts and stalls uh, around them from uh, our ports to, uh, you know, and the mechanicals having that piece. But it's, it's a way for us to understand what works with our various specialties and understanding that as we look at our processes, as we understand um, where different organizations of specialties of our physicians are along their journey and their maturity within the system thinking, um, we have to make sure that we're continuing challenging them, but understand that if they're not there, pushing forward is not going to be beneficial for the long term. But it's also then trying to understand we have dollars that are going to then still need to be saved, still efficiencies and waste still need to be removed and improved upon. So how do we do that? So that's where the thinking and the collaboration of this group with our clinical leaders, with our partnership in CCE, uh, will help us continue to evolve that going forward. We actually have, over the last probably three months, been working with CCE, um, both from Dr. Hall's group, but also from um, Lisa Olinsky's group, to really understand how do we take the processes that we've had and flow those out. So where are the touch points that we have with our physicians, um, taking the learning out of spine as well. So this week, I believe it is, we're sitting down with Rich to make sure he's aware of what's going on in that world, along with making sure that we're moving those pieces forward from a system perspective. All right. So I misspoke. That's not the last system question. I've got another one. <laughs> um, so the last question actually relates to emergency preparedness, which is something else that we do at a system level. Um, specifically, the question was, in the event of a local community emergency, to whom and how might one register or bring awareness to their clinical skill set um, that could be helpful in those times of emergent need? So this can be the easiest question we answer today. And that is Sean Eisenhower is our emergency preparedness expert that works here in the BLI. And so I would encourage if you have uh, clinical skills or you're a registered clinical provider or you just want to help out and become a member of our emergency preparedness teams and our, our other disaster preparedness teams, reach out to Sean. Um, he'd be more than happy to walk you through the process and get your name on whatever appropriate roster it needs to be on. Um, and he can help you do that. And if you just are curious about some of those processes, I know Aaron Rodgers is very involved as a supply chain representative in those programs, as well as a lot of our supply chain members that reside in the hospitals are very involved in their local HSO as well. So here in the BLI, reach out to Sean and he'll get you connected. Excellent. Okay, so now we're gonna go from a system level and focus a little more on supply chain. And I think one of the questions um, that we heard a couple times in the pre-submitted questions was around the chief supply chain officer role. So we're six months into your appointments as the co-interim supply chain leaders. 
and just want to know what update can you provide the group related to the status of this recruiting effort? Sure. So we are your interim co-leaders. Where the system is going is uh, what Lee told you six months ago. So one of the things that um, Lee mentioned six months ago was around doing a national search. So the system's taking their time and really understanding um, what the system needs in their new chief supply chain officer role, uh, what the specifics are looking for, and uh, within the last few weeks um, have hired a national recruiting firm in Corn Ferry uh, to help conduct that. Uh, Steve and I will be a part of that process as uh, the two internal candidates uh, paired against uh, the external candidates that Corn Ferry uh, brings in and uh, present to Lee and the leadership group. Uh, and uh, the goal, and we can help uh, uh, clarify this, is probably first quarter 2018 to have um, that individual uh, named and probably starting here at BJC. So either one of us or someone from the external. I would say named. <coughs> named. Q1, maybe not starting Q1. Okay, <laughs> named Q1. Unless they have a meeting in the middle. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they're sitting here today. All right. Okay, so that's kind of a, a big outstanding thing for the supply chain organization. But we had a whole bunch of questions come in around what's going to happen in 2018. So as you're starting to look at what are the departmental focus areas going to be, what are the key metrics, metrics, et cetera. Um, so the first question is, can you speak about um, what changes we might see the, to the departmental focus, especially in light of the coming business analysis process that will serve as a toll gate for projects? Sure. So the business analysis piece um, starts effective today. Uh, you should have received an email on that as well. Uh, and, and what that is looking for us to be able to do is one of the things that you've heard Steve and I talk about is people, process, and system. And this is really the process piece of understanding how we want to prioritize the work that's coming in. So if you take um, your phone calls every day and you look at them, you have internal call, you have external from hospital leadership, hospital operations, asking you know insights, information, and all of that. And how do we manage all that? And at times, it's almost like, well, this is the top of my list. I'm going to do this. Versus, how do we prioritize that piece? So our analytics team with Lynn and team and Dave have really started putting that process together to understand. Okay, when we get something in, or is that top of mind? Is that something that we should be um, really uh, putting resources to? And also, are we seeing other requests from other hospitals that we should be combining these uh, looks at? So uh, how it's going to look differently, the, the goal is really to make sure that the work that we're doing is the top priority and ties to our vision, our mission, um, our goals, along with that of BJC. So I think you kind of answered this a little bit already, but do we know what areas of focus might emerge? For example, ankles. I think it was that's the only body part you haven't looked at yet. Um, and then any current projects that might be put on the back burner. Is it too soon to know that? Uh, projects put on the back burner, yes. I think that's going to be something that's going to, um, is too soon to understand because mm -hmm. it's really looking at, you know, the work that we're doing today. We have identified uh, a lot of different projects for 2018 uh, as we are now work, working through what our targets for 2018 for the system are going to be. Uh, but it's too early to really say what goes on the back burner because I think it's really recognizing, as I mentioned earlier, how, where are the areas that we need to be pushing, what differences are going to be in 2018 that are going to allow us to challenge the system in different ways. So I, I do see um, that as a leverage point that we need to explore even more as we go into 2018. So along those lines, do you, we have any, any idea of when those key supply chain initiatives or metrics or targets for 2018 will be released and communicated across the organization? Sure, so, so your leadership team, Doug and I, and the directors are actively working on what the 2018 strategic plan looks like for supply chain. Uh, what are our key goals and measures, if, you know, the OGSM, if you will, the refresh. Um, we're leveraging what we've learned from the stakeholder survey, as well as the guidance we're getting from HIT Steering and HIT Working Group, um, and working with our various stakeholders, and then really building that as a leadership team. We're pretty, pretty far along on that. And we just have a few more details to wrap up over the next couple of staff meetings. So I would expect you'll see some version of that by late November, early December. And then 
you know, what our plans are to execute on that. One of the great things that's coming is we've spent a lot of time trying to really align it top, top to bottom. So looking at the BJC strategic imperatives and the BJC mission along with the supply chain mission and key strategies and goals and you'll start to see all of those pieces align into the people process system uh, framework that you hear Doug and I talk about. All right, so more to come on that as well. Um, we also received a few questions about um, compensation strategies and um, specifically in logistics and distribution and even more specifically as it relates to roles in different locations or those that have the same title but maybe seem to have dis different responsibilities. Can you speak to some of the plans related to compensation? I see you got your, I got my notes, you got your notes. To make sure we're consistent um, and, we, and, and we know uh, this came in a couple of different forms through the survey but essentially um, BJC and supply chain, we continue to evaluate parity among like positions across the system. Uh, position descriptions for non-exempt employees within supply chain have been routinely updated over the last three to five years to accurately reflect the work that is being done and performed. Uh, we will certainly review the level of work and skill sets at the Earth City location. There was a specific question about the roles in our, in our gateway distribution center or in that central distribution operation in our city. Um, we will include that as a part of our overall review and, and understand where if any differences exist and if so, we'll follow all of the process as outlined by working with our supply chain and compensation partners. And just, you know, one of the, um, just for clarity, there were some conversations or some questions were submitted around a particular position being uh, a higher level position or more difficult in or location because of a certain location it should be paid different and we just want to clarify that compensation is role based and depends on the role that you're in and while you know there's a lot of perceptions that maybe a job in one location may be more difficult to do than a job in another location um, Every job has its own nuances. Every job has its own challenges. And so just because uh, you have the same title is, is how we try to manage that work. Not that you know a technician in location X is a higher level technician than in location Y. If that is really true that the type of work that they do, then we work to reclassify that job and appropriately title it um, so that titles across the system have that parity and then we can manage our compensation based on that. Okay, so I'm going to stay with you because this is on a slightly related note. We also received a question about the decision to end payroll deduction um, or that option for BJC pharmacy pur purchases. And I know you spoke with Sherry Ward and got some good data on this. Uh, so can you speak to some of, or I guess your understanding of the decisions and the options available for impacted team members? And this one I am going to go verbatim since it did come from Sherry Ward. This is their area that they manage. Um, but just to provide that clarity is the mail order pharmacy is discontinuing the use of payroll deduction in order to advance the efficiency of the pharmacy through better web, uh, web services and process automation. She provided some details that today an actual pharmacist or more than one pharmacist based on different laws and regulations governing pharmacy transactions, today they have to manually key data into multiple different pharmacy systems in order to facilitate the payroll deduction feature. And so when you think about the challenges we have as a system financially and working more efficiently, you know, anything that requires a lot of manual work um, is not efficient and that's not lean thinking and it's not sustainable. And so they reviewed this decision and the cost of the operations to do all of this manual work and after a lot of review and a lot of leadership oversight and conversation, um, they decided that we need to eliminate this option because it allows the pharmacy and the retail mail order pharmacy operations to run much more efficiently. They did provide more than 90 days advance notice to allow people time to plan and that uh, everyone also benefits enrollment is coming up. So this is a, a advertisement. If you have not enrolled in a flexible savings account, that is a way 
to, to be able to pay for your pharmacy expenses that way instead of through payroll deduction because you'll get a little uh, visa type card uh, with your FSA account and you can use that to pay for your pharmacy and that is payroll deducted onto that card. So that's a, a, a form of way to pay for pharmacy and other medical expenses. Um, in addition, you can contact payroll and request the receipt of a pay card. So for example, if you don't um, have a debit card or, or any kind of a banking account that has a card tied to it, you can request a pay card where some portion of your paycheck is then put on that card every pay period and you can use that as well as a card transaction that you can register with the employee mail at a pharmacy and use that option instead. Um, and then she just added, BJC is very thoughtful about changes like this and completed a great deal of analysis to ensure it would not be detrimental in any way, especially to our um, lower salary level employees. Changes of this kind take time and we understand and we're confident it will enhance our ability to provide services and can ensure that BJC can continue to offer the current low co-pays that are in place for pharmacy plans today. All right, so a lot of information on that and a few options there as well, so thank you very much. Um, I would say just to, if you have questions about that, please reach out to the Employee Service Center. They can probably walk you through some of those options as well. Um, so we've talked over the last few town halls about how supply chain is ever evolving, how um, you guys have both outlined your thoughts around how supply chain needs to operate differently to continue to meet, to meet the needs of the organization and kind of be operating at that higher level. Um, one question we received really spoke to this idea. And the question was, uh, the person asked, what advice do you have for those struggling to adapt to the constantly changing supply chain? So, so, I, think <laughs> it's, so I think one of the things that, that when, we, when this question came in, I, I kind of looked at it and it's, so is this an individual? Is this a group? And then I stepped back a little bit and realized we were in healthcare and it's constantly changing and we have to be ones that work together to help our fellow employees, our fellow peers through different changes. So I think sometimes it's very evident why we're changing, other times it's not. Um, one of the things that Steve and I really wanted to make sure um, when we took on this interim role and we actually had the philosophy before this is the open door policy, um, at least for us. So if you do have questions, if there are things that don't make sense to you, please make sure that you're reaching out to your leader, Steve or I, um, because we recognize that, that everybody internalizes and takes things indifferently, and we wanna make sure that as an organization that, that is constantly changing, not from the standpoint that that's something we always wanna be doing, but we're evolving, we're working for ways to make, make sure we're efficient to better the uh, large organization of BJC, and we're also in an industry of change in healthcare, that if there, there are questions, if there are things that you're not um, understanding fully, reach out. We want to make sure that we're all on the same page. If there's things that we're missing that we're also incorporating. That's why you hear a lot of what we're, um, you hear Ali saying, more to come. We're not saying we have all the answers to begin with at the beginning. That's why we're looking for feedback from this group. Or we're trying different things in the pilots, which might feel that we're changing or um, uh, tweaking things, but it's trying to make sure what works for this, this group and this organization so we can continue to better ourselves. And one of the pieces I'll add to that is we had an interview as we were preparing for this and we're dialoguing around this question is uh, we also realized that we assume this question was about from someone who I'm personally struggling with managing all of the ongoing change but we also realized that potentially this question could have been asking how can I help others who are struggling so so you know if I work with different people or people you know you, you see that are always struggling with the change and so if that is the case, a lot of these same answers apply. You know, with the open door policy, if you're not sure how to manage or, do, or work with someone or help someone who seems to be struggling with a lot of the changes, um, ask. You know, come to Doug or I, come to your HR business partner, you know, come, you know, go to your, you know, cubicle mate. Um, <laughs> you know, just lean over. They're that close. I get it. But, uh, and say, you know, talk through it. You know, or even just reach out and go, it seems like, it seems like you seem to be struggling with the pace of change and a lot of things that are going on. Is there something I can do to help you? Um, so we weren't sure which angle that question was coming from. So feel free to clarify for us if we missed that. 
Um, the nice thing about an organization the size you guys have is you've got a lot of peer support. There's a lot of folks that you can tap into for that. So, okay, so we have a couple more questions that we received um, in the in response to the survey that we put out. This one is around safety, um, specifically as it relates to some of the recent events um, with car break-ins, et cetera, on the academic campus. So can you speak to what is being done to address those safety concerns? Absolutely. So, And I won't be able to give you specifically what's being done on each of our HSO campuses, but what I can tell you is that, that BJC is absolutely aware of and, and, and has as a top priority the safety of all of its employees and its patients and visitors on all of our campuses, including the BLI and the Commons and all of our other spaces. And so, um, I, you know, if you have a concern, if you're here at the BLI, come and talk to Doug and I, um, or Mana is our representative on the building committee, the building user group, you know, bring those concerns to her and she can bring it to the user group if you're on one of our HSO campuses, um, please talk to your supervisor or go talk to your security office. Um, don't be afraid to, to go ask those kinds of questions and say, look, this has been going on or I don't really feel safe or there's some situation that, that I don't feel comfortable with. Um, open up, be honest, find someone to talk to about it. If, if you don't feel comfortable talking to someone at your HSO, again, Doug or I, you know, give us a call, come see us. But employee safety, the employee safety of our patients and visitors is a very high priority for us. And so if there's something you see that may you feel like, you know, we could be missing, please bring that up. All right. Um, so the last question, we spoke in earlier town halls about um, what's going on with the BJC Collaborative and some of the changes that have been made in that space. Um, any updates on supply chain efforts within the collaborative work? Sure. For, so for those of you that um, are unfamiliar with the BJC Collaborative, it is um, a partnership uh, between BJC and now seven organizations, Lee, I believe. Four original and yeah. three came in, I believe. Um, We're all cover, counting on our fingers yeah. trying to figure that out. <laughs> covering both Missouri and, and Illinois. And the uh, initial thought around that was taking um, individual systems like ourselves and tapping into knowledge, trying different things through capital purchasing, supply chain, um, integrating some of the um, clinical aspects, the ACO world. Uh, so specifically around um, supply chain is that about two years ago, uh, we also uh, joined an organization, a group purchasing organization, uh, MSS, Midwest Service Solutions, which is a um, regional group purchasing organization from Vizient. And at the time when we did that, we became an owner, but we also said instead of duplicating a lot of the efforts that the collaborative, which are several of the owners of MSS as well, and MSS, that we would uh, funnel all of our uh, work that we would be doing as a collaborative through MSS. So again, as many of you know, we don't, we don't solely work through MSS for all of the work that we do as an organization. It is another tool in our toolbox to do that. So a couple of the things that MSS over the last year has been looking at doing to evolve um, their world are a couple things. One is they've recently la launched a clinically integrated uh, group uh, in which they are tapping the chief CNOs, CMOs, um, clinical leaders at each of the owners of MSS and bringing them together to figure out how we can better start to think about the clinical integration uh, of our supply chain. Uh, they just had their kickoff meeting uh, early in October and uh, trying to figure out what works, what doesn't. Uh, if you can imagine the, the journey we've been on over the last five years here at BJC, now taking 11 organizations and trying to do that same journey, there's a lot of um, uh, debate and uh, direction that they can be going. Uh, they've also uh, incorporated our chief information officers where they've taken in uh, those leaders across those 11 owners again to look at are there ways that we can better be organizing around the IT world. Uh, so they're testing new things, uh, not necessarily always thinking that they're going in, in some of the right direction as we've already tapped some of that world but it's another organization from a knowledge standpoint that one, we can kind of help impart where we've been on our journey, but two, also try and look at some of those regional uh, systems and what they're trying to see, how does that work within our organization? All right, a lot of work going on there. 
those are all the questions that we had submitted beforehand. And actually, this is perfect timing for us to go ahead and take our break. So we're going to go ahead and have a 10-minute break right now. We will reconvene at 1.55. I'm looking at my clock right. And um, if you have questions that you wrote down on your index cards, for those of you in the room, please make sure that you get those to Tammy, Jared, Mana, or myself, and we will go ahead and incorporate those. Um, and if you have questions that you want to ask on the mic, be thinking about that, because when we come back, we're going to answer any questions that we've received from the line, any from the room, and then also have that open mic time. So see you in 10 minutes, guys.
find your way back to your seat, please. Last question. All right, guys. Mana, can you get a music for us, please? Music? I'm not crazy. There really was music. Okay. All right, guys. Welcome back. So we have gathered the questions that were submitted here in the room and also online. Um, we're going to go ahead and work through these questions, answer them, and then we'll have it be kind of an open mic time. I will ask, um, because we do have some folks joining us online, we want to make sure that they can hear all the questions as well as the responses. So if you have a question in the room that you'd like to ask when we get to that spot or a comment that you would like to make, Please raise your hand and wait for Jared or Tammy to bring you a mic so that we can make sure everybody online can hear you as well. Because we can hear you in the room, but they won't be able to unless you're mic'd up. Sound good? Everybody can agree to that? Thank you, guys. So um, first question or first comment we had from the room says, thank you for developing the AWE program. We appreciate the flexibility offered and the personal accountability established. Why were Mondays and Fridays excluded? Ooh. I feel like a few people at one were wondering that. Yeah, you can almost then have a four-day weekend. Yeah, you, so you worked it, right? <laughs> so, so I think in, initially it was that. So as we took, um, as I said earlier, we, we took a lot of what Build had already done and adapted it into our program. And we also um, asked our leaders, uh, our directors, to say, what, what do you feel? What, what feels right? What doesn't? And since we are piloting this and this is something that we're looking at, we said, let's, let's keep Monday and Fridays out for now. Um, it may be something at the end of the pilot we look to say, you know what, that, that doesn't really make sense. Uh, let's include those. But again, it's something that we want to um, incorporate as uh, making sure that it, it doesn't fall into something that becomes an abuse or viewed that way. So we, we just excluded those two. It may change in the future. All right. Next question says, what is BJC Supply Chain's thoughts and ideas on how to retain talented and engaged employees with a limited career growth opportunity? So that's a great question, and, and of course we would, you know, love to be able to find a, a prom, you know, a promotion spot for every every great employee that wants to promote. But, you know, we only have so many. There's only so many positions in supply chain. There's only so many positions in BJC, and it's just one of those dilemmas that every every great organization like ours deals with, is actively managing people's careers, working with you to actively manage your career. And, and what does that career path look like? And while um, we'd love to be able to promote everybody, we can't. And, and it probably, you know, is, and we can talk about, you know, us personally, you know, we're very motivated, competitive individuals, and, and we know that um, you have to just be great at where you are today, um, drive value for the system up until, you know, if, the, if you need to move on, for your career and we don't have anything open for you, you know, let us try and find something for you in BJC first. Because the one thing that we do believe is the more people we can have out working in our healthcare systems, be in operations or in clinical, if you have a clinical degree, that have an appreciation for what supply chain is and what supply chain does, you know, the more disciples we can put out there in the organization, the more we can really move this organization culturally and start changing the conversation that occurs in the various departments across the system. And so number one, um, let's find opportunities for you to, to go do something inside BJC. And then sometimes we have to make personal choices and personal decisions that says, I can't find what I need in my department. I can't find what I need in the organization I work for today. And, it, and as hard as it is to lose great people, um, sometimes we have to make those personal choices and go pursue our career wherever we feel appropriate to pursue our career. The great thing is, is that um, we're always friends and we're always networked and we're always connected. And so, so I still talk to people today. You know, I left Cardinal Health to come to the provider side five years ago. I talk to a lot of people in that organization still today as we idea share and talk about how they're solving problems that are similar to problems I'm trying to solve. And so um, you just have to take some of that ownership for your career. Uh, come and talk to Doug and I, come and talk to you know, Tammy, you know, HR business partner. You know, we can also connect you with other people 
um, that can help you navigate through those career conversations. We think about it all the time when we do, the, do our talent management, when we look at performance review every year and, and, and talk about ways. There's other things, there are the things that we can get you involved in that will encourage you, uh, stretch you um, without in, it being a new position. So for example, you know, we can get you involved in maybe a, pro a project or the opportunity to work um, on a supply chain problem uh, or as a project team in an area that may not be specific to your role today, but, but gives you a different lens or a different point of view. So there are things like that that could become available. And the key is make sure you're being um, transparent with your supervisor, your leader, around where you are and where you want to be, um, what you think you need to do to get there, and, and we'll look for ways that we can partner together. And then the last piece I'll end on, though, is at the end of the day, um, career advancement is a, is a personal responsibility. So, so no one will manage your career as effectively or as passionately as you will. And so uh, taking that ownership and taking that responsibility, and, and some of us just, we understand, um, we don't have enough room to, to promote everybody in this room to a different, different job. Um, and you won't find that opportunity in any other organization either. And so um, take that for what you will, but, but we are passionate about our talent. We are passionate about uh, keeping great people inside the BJC family. To add on to one piece and to give a plug to Greg and Zeke, <laughs> one of those ways to expand your, your scope and your learning and your understanding of, of supply chain is to look into that rapid improvement event training and understand because that way you, you get out of your comfort zone. You get into areas that are still supply chain, but you could get into operations and the sourcing and the process. And it helps you understand, you know, I might have a different passion or a different way to have that dialogue with your, with your leader. So just as a plug, as Greg says, it's great to get across and get in there and we're gonna be starting that next group. But um, that is a way for you to kind of get that, that expanded scope of knowledge across the organization. Okay, so our next highly important question. Um, who had the idea to dress up and who first chose the theme? <laughs> so, so this was Doug's idea. He said, hey guys, want to do something crazy with me? And we said, sure. And then it was like, okay, figure it out. So we I'm came not up. creative. <laughs> I got so, socks, that's it. Yeah, I, my build <laughs> colleagues, I kind of said, hey, come up with some ideas. And we gave them the short list and then it became Allie and the Chipmunks because come on, that's just fun. So. Uh, well, if you can figure out everything we said no to, it might be a little prize. <laughs> yeah. This was really the safest option for many reasons. This is as close to tights as I get. That's yeah. Right. So like Spider-Man was out. Yeah, it was all. Okay. So that's where that came from. Um, all right, the next two questions actually are related. This first one had a comment that says, nice ears. So thank you. I take credit for those. Um, Second question, this one is, will there be any shared services involvement or use of the programmed clinical asset management warehouse, which is that space in Fenton? Okay, so um, I'll give you a little bit of background and for those that, that aren't familiar, so the clinical asset management team, you know, uh, which is run by Larry McWhorter and his, and his group, uh, which is in, a, in more than one warehouse in Fenton today, and so, so that operates out of three spaces, if I'm remembering right. And we've looked at the opportunity one, as they have their leases are coming up um, and operating in one unified facility has a lot of advantages to operating out of three. So, so our initial evaluation of that was, what is the opportunity to move those, all of those operations together and work out of one space? That's phase one. All of you are aware of the, the gateway warehouse or you know, the medical device depot, I think is the word going around now uh, that we're using to signify the space that we lease in the Cardinal Health Facility in Earth City. And that's been in operation for a couple of years now on a very small pilot scale around our ability to work with suppliers that will not sell to us through a distributor like Cardinal Health. But we need the value of centralized distribution and centralizing those, those products into one place, cutting one PO for the system instead of 18 POs or, or more uh, for the various departments and be able to manage that inventory. And, and the advantages that gives us as a sourcing team and as a utilization team to manage 
uh, product conversions, et cetera. And so we have seen so much positive value out of that. Um, Cardinal Health was able to free up some additional space inside of Earth City and the ability to expand into that additional space um, is going to allow us to continue to expand that program, uh, deliver a business case on that program. We are aware, however, that ultimately there are some additional opportunities and synergies that could come if we started bringing other uh, BJC operations together under that one unified facility. And so as a longer range plan, we are pulling together appropriate leaders across the BJC organization and Lee is our sponsor on this program so uh, to talk about what are things that could move into that that combined uh, central warehouse or the integrated service center is what we're going to call it when it goes live uh, the first of course will be all of the cam operations those three disparate warehouses will move in first and get things stood, stood up and running but we have built into our plan and built into our uh, legal and financial arrangements uh, with the lease holder uh, the opportunity to grow and expand into that space and first to rider refusal etc on the ability to get additional square footage as we decide to build business cases and find other operations that we could pull in there things like uh, the employee mail order pharmacy which today runs in a medical office building at some point there's a better use for that very expensive square footage in a medical office building and so operationally could we move that into that uh, unified you know integrated service center so so we're looking at those opportunities and, and other opportunities to um, things like that do I envision a day when when our medical device depot would also move in, and operate inside that integrated service center I believe there is a day when that will happen I don't have a date on that uh, we're, we're in place now it runs really well we're gonna grow it as big as we can grow it and then and for while we focus on some other um, easier things to transition into that, that space. So, so we're all working on this together uh, and talking about the opportunities to drive value through centralization. All right. So the last. Oh, bed manage. My f so beds, right? <laughs> the near and dear to our AGV team, if you're on, on, on you know, this is the right color. I don't have the AGV team shirt on, but enough. it is the right color. It's not bright enough. It's not bright enough. Okay. I forgot <laughs> the batteries. <laughs> but uh, as we know, the AGV robots that are going, you know, live in our in our new uh, campus. Um, but one of the one of our um, frustrations is the number of beds that line the tunnels and the hallways, um, and which impede the progress of robots. They can't go around beds. Um, so that is one of the programs we are evaluating is a centralized bed management program that Larry and his team and others are involved in. But, you know, there are a lot of ideas that we have been talking through. And if you have any, feel free to submit them. We'll, we'll put them on the list and, and uh, as we pull this team together, we'll evaluate them. All right. So the last question that we had submitted over the break um, is what major projects are in store for 2018 and beyond? Specifically, will we see any documented strategy for 2018 and the um, ongoing past that point? Sure. I mean, we met, as we answered an earlier, earlier question, and, and Doug can add in on that, is the, Doug and I and the directors are actively uh, pulling that together uh, and building what we want that to look like. Um, key goals, key metrics, key measures. Um, key strategies and their alignment to people process system and, and as I said you know probably in, in later November early December you will see that um, in its close to finalized form I won't promise it's finalized as we're always evolving and working and tweaking and improving um, but you know we're very close we've been working quite a bit on it over the last several weeks and I, and I think to add to so, so that's from the supply chain perspective we also have the one plan in which um, looking at contracts and doing all that and building the work that we're going to be doing to uh, impact our target for 2018. So there's a lot of moving parts and making sure again as we look at our resources are we prioritizing them on the right thing. Um, one of the things that we've done over the last six months um, with the help of Bill and Zeke and team is really look at the projects that are being requested globally for supply chain. One, are we able to resource them? Two, how do they tie into the work? And three, are they scoped to be that 
we understand the work they're going to be doing so we don't have all this scope creep. So as we manage the resources, they're on the right projects, they're focused on the right thing, but we're also flexible enough and agile enough that if something comes in that rises to the top, we know where we can pause um, and move resources there. Uh, it, it's not a fluid system yet. It is uh, something that's been tried for, you know, we've been working on it for six months. As we integrate into the BA piece, part of the analytics, that'll be another tool to help that. So more to come on, on pieces like that, but we also don't want to get so bogged down that we're focused singularly that we miss an opportunity. Um, that we are, as, as supply chain professionals look at ourselves, that we're flexible and agile enough to recognize when something pops up, we can move and address it quickly, but we also then can go back and make sure that we're hitting that business as usual work um, head on going forward. All right. So that's all the questions that were submitted. And Romana, have you had any more come in on the line? Okay, so for those of you who are joining us virtually, again, that um, form underneath your video window, you can actually utilize to submit questions. At this point, this is when we have to have some fun and we are going to open it up for questions in the room. So Tammy and uh, Jared are gonna be coming around with microphones. Please uh, raise your hand if you wanna get us started. Who's gonna be our brave soul to start us off? There always has to be one, right? All right, David. Oh, I forgot, I stole Tammy's microphone. <laughs> <laughs> this is for um, Simon and Theodore. <laughs> I feel like that should be put in their cubicle, in their office. I think Theodore was green, right, Theodore? Yeah. Uh, so my question is, and I know the answer from an IT perspective, but from a supply chain perspective, uh, what is the perception that you would like rest of BJC to have for supply chain? And then if I guess I'm thinking it through, what are the expectations that you might, might have for us in realizing that vision? So thanks, Dave. Um, I think one of the things that um, Steve and I have been working on over the last six months is, you, and, and we've taken the feedback from you, is to really make sure that we're supply chain professionals doing supply chain work. Um, we started um, putting together kind of the vision that we see. We started five years ago with uh, uh, rebranding ourselves in Supply Plus, really bringing the value and the trusted partners. And you've seen that start to um, immerse itself into the fabric of BJC. I think one of the things that um, Steve and I want to do is that um, I'm about to run out of water and we're starting to create this. Uh, we want to create more of that two-way dialogue. So right. th th this might sound as if I'm trying to get out of answering it, but I think we really want to hear from you. What do you guys see that's going to really um, how do you guys want to be perceived by BJC as, you know, you're a shared service, you're, you're um, customer focused, uh, we, we can't be all things to all people, but what are those things that are top of mind to each and every one of you that we need to be incorporating into uh, 2018? All right, so we threw the ball out to the crowd. Anybody have any thoughts? Francine. Hold on, wait for a mic. Always. Oh, <laughs> I'm just doing this to get the ball rolling, but I think some things that we can all probably agree on are competent. We want to be seen as competent. Um, we want to be seen as professional, um, and we want to be seen as caring. I think a lot of times, on, am I coming through? I think a lot of times there's a false perception that um, we don't care about what the clinical folks go through. We don't care about what the surgeons deal with in the room or physicians wherever they are. We don't care about, we don't understand how, what it's like for nurses on the floor. Um, and um, I don't think that that's true. I think there probably is some room for better understanding, maybe something like, uh, you know, walk a mile in my moccasins, if we could do a little shadowing. Um, I know we tried to do some of that, but if we could do a little bit more to better understand what their perspective is, you know, for us, uh, the cost of supplies is what we do all day, every day. Um, for the folks who actually use these things, it's one of a hundred things that wraps into their day. So um, I guess I would just like them to know that we, and we know that, we understand that, and we're, we're on the same team. We're trying to make things better for them too. Very good, thank Sarah? you, Francine. No, I think, I think that's just to add on to what, Fran I think that's great. I think. Um, one of the things when I was uh, in my prior role at Alton uh, that we did is we had two groups. We had our lab group and our nursing group that uh, really thought that the nursing group says, well, we don't understand why it takes labs so long to get a result on when we send them down. And, you know, basically all they do is take our tube, put it in the machine, hit a button, and wait for the result. 
Our lab folks took offense to that. <laughs> our lab folks, on the other hand, said, we don't understand when we send results up to the floor why they get lost, where it goes. You know, we, we put it in this nice folder, we send it up there. And so both of them were coming at it from a single point of view. Um, and we flipped it. So similar to what uh, Francine was suggesting is, how do we make sure that not only do we as a customer focus group understand what our customers are going through, but I think as, as I've talked to some of our customers, they don't realize, they go, well, all we said is we, we want this. Well, you said you want this, Lee said he wants this, Jeremy said he wants this, and trying to balance those pieces, that's the art that we walk through too. So trying to make sure that the view is both ways. So how do we make sure that, you know, they see as, you know, Steve always says, you know, how do we make sure we're seen as supply chain experts and we can ease a burden off of them while also adding to that they can now spend more time at the clinical bedside with the patients and others that we're as a team. We're, we're not taking any work, we're not trying to do it, we're all on the same team at the end of the day working to benefit our patients and our community. Yeah, there's some key pieces out there too, you know, anybody that's been around and is familiar with ARM and in a lot of their literature that talks about how supply chain is at the intersection of cost, quality, and outcome. You know, and that is the role that we play right in that intersection and that, and that the execute, we are critical to the execution of the tri triple aim. And there's, a, there's other documentation out there. So it's, I agree is, is we're a lot more than just unit price and unit cost. And it's sharing that and that's how we want to be seen. Um, but Back to, think? you know, this is your organization, this is your department. So I thought I saw another hand when Francine jumped up, or I may have imagined it. Oh, Zeke, all right, get you a mic here. <laughs> I think I'm probably saying the same thing that Francine was, but really to be the preferred business partner that we actually take on that role, not just for supply chain things, but some of the other opportunities. Maybe the, the DNI, I know you were at the big DNI function, um, diversity inclusion function last week, uh, but there's maybe some little things that we can do because we are a shared service. So we already have the network, the contact, contacts throughout all the HSOs. If we can just piggyback to a few of those things, it'll actually propel us and we'll be seen to those partners beyond just supply chain. Absolutely. Other thoughts, other um, things that are going through your mind when you guys think about what's your ideal reputation or what you want to be known for, or how you want to be perceived as an organization? Or flip it, what don't you want to be known for? <laughs> There's I think, that too. I think, I think, well, a lot of the time it's the negative that gets more of the press than the positive. Yeah. Um, and, but it's taking that view and really flipping it into what is it that we want to craft for ourselves. You know, I, I, I hear a lot from each and every one of you, and I'm looking at you, I'm like, I know each and every one of you has a thought on this. And uh, what we're asking for, and you know, again, this is our foray into this format. So um, think about this for, for December, um, because this is 15 minutes that we were focused on this. We're probably gonna look to expand it a little bit more. We'll see if that makes this crowd shrink. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hopefully it grows the crowd as opposed to shrinks <laughs> the crowd. Uh, but, it, but this is something that, that we feel it, it can't be Steve and, Steve and I are more your face representing all of you. We wanna make sure that we're representing you in the way that you wanna be represented as. And as we said, we're a constant learning, changing organization. So if there are things we need to be thinking about differently, each and every one of you see yourselves, the group, the organization a little differently we want to make sure that that representation is not only making it to the hospital level, but is making it to Lee's level and Rich's level so we can continually be that front-facing organization that is helping drive the benefit that BJC has to its community. Is there anything that we have not answered? I mean, if you've got a question, no matter what, you know, here's your chance. Now's the time. Yeah, yeah. please. All right, Kelly, go ahead and stand up, babe. Um, back on the idea about perception, have we ever thought about doing uh, road shows out into the clinical areas and the facility areas? Um, I know Anna and I have been very successful. We go out to the facilities, um, every single one of them each year, and the feedback has been phenomenal. They really, really are grateful for that. 
And it's us just opening up the floor. We're not going there for any specific reason, mm -hmm. except to say, what can we do for you? And we have gotten so much feedback on that, that we wish you guys would do more road shows because we didn't know you did this stuff for us. And we just live and breathe this every day. Yeah. And I think we think everybody knows how it works. And then they're like, well, I had no idea. I was signing contracts and I was negotiating this. And we're like, oh, oh my God, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if they had known, they don't want to do that. They, they have a real job to do. And when they find out that there's somebody here who's a professional and does this for a living, they're glad to hand it over to you. Um, so I think that it would be really beneficial if we went out and did road shows to educate people. Just a thought. It's a great yeah. suggestion. I'm making notes here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, other thoughts, comments, or questions around this idea of how you want to be perceived or known for or not known for? Any online? Yeah. Yep. This is just to uh, not being known for. Uh, I think we're often put in the predicament of time versus value. So with current events today, it just keeps resonating in my mind, the Puerto Rico contract that was signed and all the value that was lost there. So with the insurance and warranties and things like that that we all look into, I <coughs> just hope that the perception is that we're not delaying stuff just to, to delay it, but we're actually doing it for a reason. Other thoughts? All right. Okay. So we've got a few minutes left. Do you guys want to go ahead? We sent out a couple of other prompting kind of thought questions. Do we want to go ahead and, and spend a little bit of time on one of those before we close up? Yeah, I, I, and I think this, this one adds on a little to it. So what additional things do you think we, and it's the group we, both virtual and in here, um, can do better to drive collaboration within supply chain. And I think we touched maybe a little bit on it, but you know, are there other ways, other thinkings, other approaches that we can do from both an internal collaboration with ourselves along with across the system? I just know, you know, I came from a standalone a long time ago, you know, when they were still around. They're not there much, but when you get the full picture of supply chain, you know, so when you have requisition, purchase to a receiving, to pay. Keep it to, right here. Oh, to. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, the mic can't dance. It doesn't it follow can't. with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, it's, it's just nice to, that I know that picture. But there's a lot of people that have come from other places and they don't know that whole picture of supply chain. So I think we could do a better job internally. It's just my thought. So, so the pull on that thread just a little bit more, Eileen. Are you talking about when we onboard um, new staff members in, onto our team of how we start to maybe help connect some of those dots better? I think we even have employees today that need to help connect those dots. Okay. And onboarding for sure. So onboarding and current. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Excellent. What else? All right, Aaron, hold on. Tammy's coming up. I would say best question, get to ride on an AGV, but I've been told that's a no-no. A no-no? Not allowed to ride on it. Dang. You can give them candy. <laughs> uh, so this kind of goes in the, in the vein of some of the other uh, questions and comments that have been put there. But So my recent project is out at Missouri Baptist and doing the storeroom redesign. Uh, but just having gone out there and it, the, the direct interaction with additional supply chain folks, that we don't normally get to interact with is a greater appreciation for what they go through and the challenges that they face on a day-to-day -day basis and knowing that there's resources coming from um, supply chain in order to help them address that as well as looking at other uh, hospitals that are looking at to do the same event. Um, but just knowing the challenges that they face just from, from everything from FTE standpoint to uh, space, square footage space to uh, the types of supplies that are coming in and the changes that we are integrating and putting on them and they're having to implement. So I think having that awareness and having that uh, insight into their daily operations is, is probably a, a greater uh, insight into the collaboration that we need. So. Excellent. What else?
One thing I would just share to piggy on back on what Aaron said, and something we, we work with often, especially when we're out in the HSOs working with our logistics teams and our supply technicians and inventory coordinators and all of our you know, supervisors and everybody is kind of a, one of those aha moments um, to you know, even Kelly's point when you get out and you see how, how life is a little bit is you know one, one of the big aha moment for me one day and this is you know probably a year ago but is the technician who's doing the work in the supply room you know they're stocking the stocking the, the bins and and doing the counting most of the time for the large majority of our customer base that technician is the face of supply chain to our customers so that person is the one who's actually answering why we're using you know nestle water instead of you know purina water or something like that they're the ones that are there answering that direct staff to staff conversation around why are we using this product and not that product or how come we're always out of this product so so in most cases our our most entry level position and in you know arguably you know some of our you know but also of our most diverse population you know they're the ones that are on the floor in every single day and they are the face of supply chain so i think you know appreciating the work that they do more and, and then taking an opportunity to go get to know our technicians and talk to them about you know what are you hearing you know what are you hearing from the nursing staff or what are you hearing from the lab staff what are you hearing from you know and use that feedback to make the work that we do back here better um, could go a long ways all right well, in the interest of time, I am going to go ahead and kind of pull, pull us together to a close, but I did want to open it up. Any final questions for Doug or Steve before we close things out? Oh, Jeremy, I almost totally got you. I thought that was a hand. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a hand. It looked like Anybody it. want to vote on it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so since I don't have any takers here in the room, um, any last comments from either of you that you want to make? Uh, just a few. Uh, one is uh, happy Halloween Eve. So everybody be safe tomorrow night as hopefully some of you will dress up um, and stay warm. Uh, the, the other piece I would say is that, you know, six months in is, as we talked about this, um, from the perspective of Steve and I, it has been an honor to represent you. And that's part of the reason why we want to have these dialogues is to make sure that we are representing you in the way that you want to be represented to not only the leaders at the hospital, to our senior leaders, uh, but to our community. We take you know, the responsibility that both of us have been given to see how we continue to move this forward. So hopefully you haven't felt that over the last six months we've been stalled, especially with the question of there is change going on within supply chain, because we are looking to continue to advance the group within this and um, put this group at the center of a lot of what's going on within BJC. So again, thank you um, and enjoy Halloween. All right. yeah, I agree, happy Halloween. And thank you very much for the work that each of you do every day. Uh, I am slightly biased, but we are the best healthcare supply chain organization in the United States. We've seen them, slightly and biased. trust us, you're the best. <laughs> so so um, thank you very much. All right. So thank you guys for your time and attention again today. As they said, we're trying to make these even more interactive. So what you saw today with the Q&A and the opportunity for some interactive dialogue, anticipate that's only going to get bigger and better and better. So we look forward to more questions when we meet again in December. Who knows what we'll be wearing that time around. Um, remember, for those co-workers who were unable to join us, we will have the playback available um, and the link sent out via email. So you can come, go back and share that with anyone who wasn't able to join us today. Um, and have a great rest of your day. We'll see you guys later. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> no, it gives you a headache.